Welcome, and it's great to see you all today. Terrific audience here at the Miller Center, and for all of you uh, watching on Zoom or on YouTube, thank you for joining us today. Today's topic, Holding Presidents Accountable, comes out of a conference we held at the Miller Center back in October of last year on the state of the American presidency, and along with big topics like how presidents work or don't work with Congress, the role of the civil service, what we call bureaucracy and democracy, um, and also how we pick our presidents and how presidents unite the country. We also decided to stay focused on how we hold presidents accountable. This is an issue that goes back to the founding of the Republic with the fear of a monarch who would act beyond the law. And uh, as we turned the corner to 2024, holding presidents accountable was going to be a centerpiece of the coming election year. And we are really thrilled today to partner with the Karst Center on Democracy at the University of Virginia School of Law to put together today's event. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce our four uh, participant panelists who are really part of the Miller Center family. And we are really blessed at this university and at, and at the Miller Center to have truly national quality experts on these topics. I'm going to step over here so you can see them as I describe them. Uh, I'm going to start with Tim Hafey. Uh, Tim is a partner at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. He was the lead investigative attorney on the January 6th commission, the bipartisan commission of Congress from a few years back um, that looked at the January 6th attack on the Capitol. He is, uh, teaches as a lecturer at UVA Law School, had been UVA's general counsel, and had been the US attorney for the Western District, and maybe most importantly, from the powerful class of 1986 at the <laughs> University of Virginia, as well as a UVA Law, law, law. grad. Um, to Tim's right, not necessarily politically, Barbara <laughs> Perry, um, who is the Jerry Belisles professor here at the Miller Center, co-directs directs our oral history program, was for nine years the director of presidential studies. Um, but she's also an expert, having done her doctorate here at the University of Virginia on the politics of the Supreme Court. And for our October conference, she wrote a terrific essay on how the Supreme Court does or doesn't contain a president that goes beyond constitutional bounds. Joining by Zoom is Sai Prakash, a Miller Center faculty fellow, who is also the James Monroe Professor at the University of Virginia Law School, as well as the Paul Mahoney Professor at the University of Virginia Law School. Former Supreme Court clerk for uh, Clarence Thomas, and also for that conference wrote a terrific essay on how Congress could hold presidents accountable on a number of different topics. And it's Sai, it's great to have you with us today. Sai is doing a visiting term at Harvard Law School, I believe. Um, he's gonna nod, I'm looking at him. He's, he doesn't see that, there we go. <laughs> Terrific, thank you, Sai. Um, and then finally, managing today's conversation is Micah Schwartzman. Micah is the um, Hardy Cross Dillard Professor at the University of Virginia Law School after having been the Harvey Cross Dillard scholar when he was a student at the University of Virginia Law That's School. True. I'd like to meet Harvey Cross Dillard. Um, he's also the co-director of the Carr Center on Law and Democracy. Uh, he is a UVA grad, a UVA law grad with his doctorate from Oxford where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He's clerked on the US Court of Appeals and we are just thrilled to have him as a partner in so many different things. And Mike, I'm gonna just turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Bill. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So I, I wanna thank uh, the Miller Center and uh, Bill Antholis for hosting us for this uh, important topic today. Um, as you know, uh, former President Trump is in court today uh, for uh, hearing in New York, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we get into the legalities of the various challenges that former President Trump and that President Biden face, I wanted to start out with a question to Barbara about um, how our uh, founders of the Constitution envisioned holding the president accountable. What were some of the constitutional mechanisms, some of the means by which they thought the presidency might be checked in one way or another? Well, thank you, Micah, and it's just an honor to be on the stage with my colleagues, and uh, thank you not only to Bill, but Christina and Alfred and Mike and the whole team uh, for putting this together today, and thank you all for being here on such a beautiful day that feels like summer, suddenly. Um, I also want to say to Bill, I am a proud member as well of the UVA class of 86. Unfortunately for my senior status, that's my graduate school class, not my undergraduate <laughs> class. 
Uh, but in any event, I thought I would start with a little experiment. Uh, I like audience participation. So if you are in our in-person audience today or if you're watching online, I'd like all of you to raise your right hand. Okay, repeat after me. I, I. <laughs> say your name. Okay. Yeah, I, there's always one in every crowd. <laughs> Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office. Of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution, the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States. So, help me God. so help me God. Congratulations, you all are presidents of the United <laughs> States now. I, didn't, I don't know if you knew yet. Now, I started that way, first of all, because I like audience participation. Always wakes the audience up. But also to say, what does that mean? The question was, what did the founders put in the Constitution that has something to do with presidential accountability? So just think of those words you have just said and that are used to swear in every president of the United States going back to George Washington. That oath is prescribed in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. Um, just playing around with it yesterday, I thought, well, does faithfully executing the office of President of the United States, does that mean that the President will, be, will abide by the laws of the United States or simply execute them as they involve other people? Uh, and the other, to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States would indicate to me uh, that that is also following the strictures of the Constitution and, I would say, the laws that have been made under it. So that's number one. Number two, let's go back to pre-Constitution. Um, what was our first Constitution in this country? Articles of Confederation. They did not have, as we know it, an executive branch or a president as a head of an executive branch as we know it. Why was that? They had just fought a revolution to get away from a kingly monarchical system uh, of some supreme power, but obviously after the glorious revolution of, of England, yes, a parliamentary system. But they did not want to have anything that smacked of kingship or queenship or monarchy. So they created, because by the way, I just went to Montpelier on Saturday to soak in the Constitution and the father thereof, as well as Dolly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really imbued today with the constitutional spirit. And it makes me realize that in creating these three branches of government, we all learned in civics class, three branches of government, separation of powers, right? So that there wouldn't be one branch that would have too many powers. And certainly the head of that executive branch, the president, wouldn't have too many powers. So that's one element of how the structure was based in order not to have too powerful a president. What about accountability? Something that came to mind immediately in thinking about this topic was Alexander Hamilton writing in one of the Federalist Papers. And he indicated that people shouldn't be worried now that we were moving from the Articles to what he hoped would be a ratified new constitution, that there would be this one president. And he talked about the possibility of, a, I'll use the Russian word, a troika. What if we had a committee that would head the executive branch, let's say three people. And so one of his reasonings in the Federalist paper that he was writing on the executive branch was, but if something goes wrong, if that troika makes a bad decision, or we could even say breaks the law, which of them is accountable? So he said, it's a good thing that we're going to have one, if you will, unified president. So those are just some of the things I think to think about in terms of how the founders wanted to keep tabs on the power of the president as well as, I would argue, accountability 
through what I think is more of a political means, like impeachment. And so I said, I'm a political scientist. I'll talk about some of the political strictures and the political ways that we can make presidents accountable, and then leave it up to Cy and Tim and Micah, the lawyers in our group today, to talk about the legal aspects. I think one of our themes uh, for this, this program is going to be the relationship between political accountability and the law and rule of law and legal challenges. So I, in order to set that part up, I want to um, ask Tim to give us an overview of some of the uh, criminal charges, the indictments that have been brought against former President Trump, just to lay out where we are right now. We've got four cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you've all, all read headlines from today about the one in New York, but we have uh, an important federal case in Washington, D.C. We have a case in Georgia about election interference and a case in Florida about improper document retention. Uh, if you could give us kind of a lay of the land uh, about where these uh, various um, criminal cases stand right now, uh, how are they looking to develop, what's the sure. timeline like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I appreciate the question and the invitation, Bill, and the folks at Miller Center. Thanks for having me. I think my role on the panel is as the former prosecutor. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the appropriateness of criminal charges, and uh, I'm happy to walk you through the 88 counts that are currently <laughs> pending against the former president, uh, starting with the one that's in court today. As Micah said, just this morning in New York City, in the state court in New York, uh, the, the former president is on trial for falsification of business records. He is alleged to have made essentially hush money payments to a woman with whom he had an extramarital affair uh, it, right before the 2016 election in an effort to silence her, to prevent her from coming forward with that information, and then falsifying the records by disguising them as payments to his lawyer, Michael Cohen, who in turn made the payment. So he paid Cohen, called them retention payments, payments for legal services, when actually they were funneled, allegedly funneled to uh, the, the paramour Stormy Daniels. Um, that is a felony because the allegation is that the falsification was meant to facilitate an underlying crime. And the New York District Attorney has said that the underlying crimes are a tax offense of different tax consequences, depending on the purpose of the, of the money spent, or a campaign finance violation. Essentially, that is a benefit conferred by Ms. Daniels that benefited his campaign, arguably triggering Cap, uh, campaign finance, a federal crime of campaign finance reform. So that is the first case that will be resolved. Jury is, is being impaneled and selected today. It's predicted to go probably six weeks or so. And it may be the only case that is adjudicated before the fall election. Because the three other cases, criminal cases that are pending against the former president are currently held up in a little bit of pre-trial limbo. They, I don't believe any of them have actual scheduled trial dates. The one with which I am most familiar from my work on the select committee is the federal case alleging uh, a conspiracy to disrupt an official proceeding, the joint session of Congress on January 6th. I think this is probably the most serious, at least in terms of sort of orders of magnitude, of relative culpability of the four. Uh, the, the special counsel of, at the Department of Justice is, has assembled evidence that set, alleges that the former president engaged in a very purposeful, intentional, multi-part plan to disrupt the joint session. The, the joint session is when Congress comes together to certify the results of the election, to prevent that certification from happening and prevent the ultimate transfer of power. Very serious allegations preventing the transfer of power cuts to the, to the very core of democracy. Relatively straightforward, though, in terms of the, con the concept of the counts. Is there, did, is there evidence that the former president intentionally meant to disrupt that joint session? That's essentially the core allegation. There's a conspiracy to defraud the United States count. There's a deprivation of civil rights count because it would divest people of their fundamental right to vote. But the core allegation is this multi-part plan to disrupt the joint session. That's essentially the evidence that the select committee presented over the course of our investigation. Very similar theory in the Georgia case. The, the, the uh, district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, has alleged a racketeering conspiracy. A racketeering conspiracy is sort of a fancy term for a crime spree that the former president, and over a series of events, conspired with other people, and I think there are 16 or 17 other defendants in that case, to prevent the certification of the Georgia election. 
that reaches beyond Georgia to some of the events that are also at issue in the federal case. But the core allegation is that the president, by the submission of fake electors, uh, by the, put the pressure on members of Congress and the vice president and his own Justice Department, intended to essentially deprive Georgia voters of, uh, of, their, of their vote and their certified uh, election for President-elect Biden. That is uncertain in terms of time frame. And then finally, the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. This is for conduct that occurred after the former president left office. He maintained a bunch of stuff, a bunch of documents that included classified information, national security information. He's charged with violations of the Espionage Act, which essentially means the unlawful possession of uh, national security information. It's not um, a case that really involves the paper. It's more the underlying information that he's charged with unlawfully possessing. And there's also an obstruction count in that case, where he's charged with not only the underlying allegation of the, possession, the Espionage Act possession of that national security information, but then attempting to obstruct the investigation of that by trying to destroy documents or get encourage people not to cooperate uh, with the prosecutor. So your, your last question, Michael, was when um, the United States Supreme Court is evaluating a claim of absolute presidential immunity. The former president has essentially argued, first at the trial court in front of Judge Chutkin in DC, then at the DC circuit, and now in front of the Supreme Court in a case that will be argued next week, that he is absolutely immune from prosecution for acts undertaken in his official capacity. Judge Chutkin denied that and said, no one is above the law. You're not necessarily immune, even for acts that took, you took in your official capacity. And by the way, these may not even have been acts that were in your official capacity. They are, according to the government's theory, separate and apart from your official responsibilities as president. The Supreme Court will evaluate that immunity claim. And if they resolve it quickly, then that case could get scheduled for trial late summer or fall. If they take until the end of their term, which is typically in June, then it'll be difficult to get that case tried before the election. So that's an open question as to how quickly, expeditiously they resolve that. I believe in the Georgia case, there's some pretrial litigation about uh, a lot of different evidentiary issue, issues, including immunity, and there was an alleged conflict of interest between the, the prosecutor and one of her subordinates. That's been resolved, and one of the special appointees that the DA appointed has, has left the case. That, though, um, probably will not get resolved before the election. There are a lot of defendants remaining in that case, all of whom are bringing different motions, no trial date yet set. And then the Mar-a-Lago case is complicated because it involves the potential admission of classified information. Some of the evidence in the case may, in fact, have to be uh, only viewed with people, by people with a clearance and may want to be presented to a jury, which is complicated. So the, the discovery process and the use of particular categories of evidence makes that case a little more complicated. It's also a very inexperienced judge in that case. Judge Cannon has only had, I believe, four criminal trials as a judge and has been slow to rule, much slower than Judge Chutkin uh, in, the, in the January 6th case. Uncertain when that'll be tried. Great, thank you for a really excellent and succinct overview of those cases. Uh, I wanna turn now um, to Sai and ask uh, about legal challenges that um, President Biden is, uh, is facing. Um, that was including the appointment of a special counsel by the Department of Justice. And uh, late last year, the House uh, approved an impeachment inquiry into the sitting president. Um, can you tell us about the grounds for those investigations, something about how they've been handled? And then I think, I think uh, a common question at this point is whether uh, President Biden is likely to face criminal charges like former President Trump um, has um, after he's president, whenever, whenever that might be. Well, it's, it's great to be here with you folks today. Thank you for having me. Um, well, you know, uh, the President Biden, as you said, was investigated by a special counsel appointed by the Attorney General into his retention of classified documents that go back to his time in the Senate, but also go back to his time as Vice President. And of course, he had some in his garage and he had some, I think, elsewhere uh, in, his, in his residence and he has multiple residences. And so it's it's sort of a similar circumstance as, as President Trump. And the report that the special counsel wrote is very long and very detailed. And special, special counsel seemed to think that President Biden had uh, knowingly and willfully retained classified information. 
uh, from his time in the Senate and from his time as vice president, um, but that uh, they didn't, they weren't sure that they could get a conviction from a jury because they thought that President Biden would make a sympathetic defendant. Uh, in part because they thought President Biden would be able to say that he had forgotten about the documents. And so it wasn't uh, quite an exoneration for Vice President Biden, uh, sorry, for President Biden. Um, and there was some, I guess, hint that perhaps if uh, President Biden were younger, they might actually go ahead and try to bring a prosecution. Of course, it's complicated by the fact that it's Department of Justice policy that uh, no sitting president can be indicted much less prosecuted and punished. And so, uh, you know, they said at the outset, we, you know, notwithstanding that uh, that DOJ policy, we don't recommend any any prosecution, and by which they mean they don't anticipate prosecuting him uh, after he leaves office. So the, you know, it's sort of a, a split decision of sort because it doesn't uh, precisely exonerate the vice president. They say he willfully retained this information and shared it with, uh, or shared, shared it with a reporter or a, a book author who was helping him write a book. Uh, and it goes into all kinds of detail about, about the retention of classified documents. But, but ultimately, the, the, the conclusion was that no charges uh, ought to be brought. Um, and they do, of course, mention the, the Trump situation down in Florida, and they distinguish it by saying uh, President Trump uh, you know, tried to obstruct the, uh, or, or tried to keep those documents even after they were requested a second time uh, by the government. And so there's a slight difference there. Um, is, something, is, is someone saying something? I'm sorry, did I, did I interrupt someone? No, you're good. Okay. Um, and what were the other questions, Micah? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think there was a question about whether we anticipate any, any criminal investigations or charges post-presidency, as we've seen with former President Trump. Well, I, I mean, I think it partly turns on whether President Trump returns to become President Trump. I, he has promised retribution of various sorts against his enemies. Uh, of course, some people think that uh, uh, all, some or all of these charges are, uh, reflect politics more than the law. And of course, you could think that about some of them and not others, right? That is to say, you might think that some of the some of the charges are serious and warranted investigation and possible prosecution, and you could think that's less than true with respect to the others. Um, but uh, of course, it's possible that uh, you know someone uh, who wants to go after President Biden might bring charges. I don't know what you know what the race judicata effect of the special counsel's report is. Um, I don't know if it precludes the Department of Justice from revisiting uh, the classified documents case. Uh, and uh, we do know that when President Trump was President Trump, he had talked about going after Hillary Clinton and he had participated in chants of lock her up. But once he became president, he decided uh, that was not a, a good thing to do. And so it's possible that he might decide that again. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't possibly predict whether uh, President Biden will be uh, prosecuted going forward, and of course, you know, besides the besides the classified document stuff, there's al also all the stuff having to do with his son, um, which, you know, there's been no discussion of prosecuting him. But um, if if you think that his son, you know, was earning money and then using it to pay for uh, uh, President's Biden, the upkeep of President Biden's house, as as his son indicated. There might be some tax implications there, but I, I haven't. There's obviously no special counsel investigating any of that. So you mentioned an opinion uh, from the Office of Legal Counsel that um, that basically bars uh, the government from prosecuting criminally a sitting president. And Tim mentioned that there's a pending case, uh, Trump against the United States, which raises the question of whether um, a former president can be prosecuted uh, for um, crimes committed while he was in office. Uh, I, I wanted to ask both of you to comment on this presidential immunity suit, which is currently pending before the Supreme Court. Tim has already m mentioned it, but uh, what are the major issues in this case? What are its implications for the rule of law? I think that's the, the really large uh, question that this um, case represents, but maybe, maybe you can give us some thoughts about uh, where, where this case is right now and what are its implications? I'll start with you, Sai, if you, sorry, you can't. Sure, start. sure. So, um, 
you know, President Trump's lawyers are arguing that the president has absolute immunity for his official acts as president and that they can't, you know, he, they can't result in a prosecution, save for perhaps where the Senate uh, has voted to, to uh, impeach, sorry, convict and remove. So there's been a House impeachment, a Senate trial, a Senate vote to convict, and then a removal. That's a circumstance where the president's official acts can, I think, then lead to some sort of criminal liability. Absent that, the president can't be proceeded against for his uh, his his criminal acts while you know while, while taken in his capacity as president. And you know, as people are perhaps aware, the Constitution doesn't expressly confer any presidential privileges or immunities, but the courts have recognized certain privileges and immunities uh, over the last 50 years starting with the Nixon tapes case where the court decided that the tapes had to be handed over before saying that the president had a right to confidential communications with his aides. And then there was a case called Nixon versus Fitzgerald, which was an employee who had sued the president for being fired. And the court there said uh, there's a, an absolute immunity from damage actions that arise out of your official acts. And it's that case that the Trump lawyers are citing for the proposition that the president shouldn't be able to be criminally prosecuted for his official acts. And, and they're arguing the same, they're using the same kind of logic that underlay that opinion, which is the president should be able to make decisions uh, on behalf of the United States in his official capacity without fear or favor, shouldn't be looking over his shoulder to see if he's going to, he or she's going to be prosecuted. He or she can't do that if they're worried that they will be potentially prosecuted once they leave office. Um, and so it's not as if there's no materials for the president, or former president's lawyers to work with. Um, but of course, uh, immunity from civil damages is different than immunity from criminal prosecution. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if I've seen this sort of argument been made before prior to this case. It's understandable why they made it, but I, I don't, uh, it's there's, there's nothing in the Constitution again, and there's nothing in early commentary suggesting that the president, a former president, can't be prosecuted while in office. The OLC opinion I mentioned earlier is about prosecuting a sitting president. It doesn't, it doesn't say that the president can't be prosecuted once he leaves office. And in fact, I think it implies that he can be prosecuted after he leaves office. It talks about how impeachment is the mechanism of accountability while they're in office, and then prosecution's a possibility after the fact. Yeah, it's hard to underestimate the significance of this in terms of the, the impact on the rule of law. I mean, the president's essentially arguing that anything he does is president, regardless of how criminal or how outrageous, as long as it is connected somehow to his official role as president, uh, is above the law, can't be prosecuted. You know, the, the judge, one of the judges on the D.C. Circuit during the argument asked the president's lawyer, so if the president had SEAL Team 6 assassinate a political rival, would seem like an official act. He's doing it for political goal. Is your position that he would be immune from prosecution? And essentially, the president's lawyer said yes. That unless he'd been impeached first, I think was the response. Impeachment is a precondition to criminal prosecution. A whole cloth, no, no precedent whatsoever for that. And I just, I just can't believe that that could be the Supreme Court's view, that, uh, that there, our constitutional system would contemplate giving any one person that ultimate authority to, with impunity, violate the law while in office. Um, I think Judge Chutkin, the D.C. Circuit, uh, got it right, candidly, when they said no person is above the law. And if you assassinate a political rival or you purposefully obstruct an official proceeding and try to subvert the transfer of power, that is an appropriate, if a jury, with the presumption of innocence and vigorous cross-examination, finds the violation of those statutes, then you can be held accountable. Um, I don't know what the Supreme Court will do. I, no one can really divine what, uh, why they took the case and what they will do uh, now that they're going to hear argument. My hope is that it is a, an issue of such magnitude that they felt like it was important enough for them to weigh in, but that it doesn't suggest that it's close, because I don't think that it is close. I think it's a slam dunk winner for the special counsel and uh, will likely be found that uh, by the Supreme Court. The only other thing really quickly, while I, if I can, just to push back a little bit on what Sai said about the Biden possession of classified information 
being sort of similar to the Trump possession, fundamentally disagree with, with that, with all due respect. They're really, really different situations. President Biden took some notes during meetings, and he kept the notes. And he had a few pages of, of documents, a very small number that he inadvertently had in his papers, completely cooperated at all times with the investigation, provided the documents when they were requested. And uh, that is fundamentally different from the allegations in the Mar-a-Lago case, where there's a persistent effort to hold on to the information, to pr not provide it to the government. Uh, and I, and the, the sort of false equivalency of the two, I, I just strongly disagree with that. Well, can I just say something, Rook? I, I agree with everything that Tim said. I agree with that. It's just that they both retain classified information. That part is the same. The, the Trump attempt to hide the documents after they're requested is fundamentally different. That was going to be my bipartisan <laughs> question uh, to our lawyers, and that is, and could, could I add in uh, former Vice President Pence, uh, who also apparently had some oh. some documents, um, to the lawyers? Then how do you how will the how would the courts distinguish among those three? I think Tim, you've already answered part of that, and then also as a layperson on the stage, as, as far as law is concerned, um, why the Espionage Act? Um, for the Mar-a-Lago documents and not Presidential Records Act? Presidential Records Act is a civil statute. Um, it, it is a statute that governs what presidents must maintain and what must be turned over to the archives upon completion of their term. The Espionage Act is a criminal statute that says if you, um, if you intentionally possess, again, information, it could be con contained in documents, but it's the information, not necessarily the pieces of paper then it, that is the crime. So they're just, the Presidential Records Act, this is another motion in front of Judge Cannon. The special counsel says it has no application to, to the Espionage Act whatsoever. The compliance with the civil statute uh, is just completely separate and apart and irrelevant to whether or not there's evidence of the willful possession of national security information. I want to ask all of you a question about the relationship between impeachment and these criminal investigations that we've been talking about. <laughs> so I mentioned that you, you could think about impeachment as a process that happens while a president is sitting and criminal investigations as something that's possible after. I mean, w one thought you might have looking at the last uh, few decades of, um, of uh, presidential ac accountability, you could you think back to the Clinton administration, we've had three impeachment processes since then, none, none of which were successful in procuring a conviction. And now we have a series of uh, criminal prosecutions. And so one, one question I think that may be looming for, for some people is, does impeachment work? And is it really being displaced by criminal investigation as a means of holding presidents accountable? Have we moved on from what was designated as a constitutional process to uh, to a kind of fallback mechanism at this point, and how should we think about the relationship between them? It wasn't directed to anyone. Right, should I take a yeah. crack? I mean, I think there are three mechanisms of accountability in the modern era, right? There's impeachment, there's a criminal prosecution, which we've never seen before, but we're seeing now. And then there's just ordinary lawsuits, right? And ordinary lawsuits do help indicate the law. They just don't really punish the, the president. And so there are tons of lawsuits against every administration in the modern era trying to say that they're violating various acts and some of them are quite successful and some are not. But that's probably the principal means of, of judicial accountability. Impeachment is just a mechanism of removal, right? Uh, and it's sort of a, you know, it's a capital sentence, so to speak. Uh, it's, proven, it's proven useful for judges. No executive branch official has ever been impeached and removed. And when I say executive branch, I mean like department heads haven't been impeached and removed. Now, oftentimes they've resigned because they knew they were going to be uh, removed, but that was true for Nixon as well, right? I think Nixon thought he was going to be uh, uh, you know, convicted in the Senate and removed. And so why, why be the first president to actually be convicted? He, he, uh, he resigned. I think that in the modern era, you know, since Nixon, we have parties that are much more um, attentive to the president's, uh, uh, you know, situation. They, 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 they feel like it's a party-centered politics, as, as a Miller Center fellow has said. <laughs> and what that means is when the president's attacked by members of the other party, they, the, their co-partisans rally around the president. And in a system where you need two-thirds of the Senate, it just becomes impossible to, to get a conviction. It's, it's not too hard to get an impeachment. It's impossible to get a conviction. And so I think impeachment 
is more of a political tool than it is a mechanism of removal. If, if you're really facing a, a possibility of a Senate uh, co conviction, you're probably also just thinking about resigning before they ever get to that. Yeah, there's a fundamental concept in law uh, called fair notice, that, that it's, it's the fundamental part of our system of criminal justice is that there are very clear standards to which people are, are, are held. Crimes have elements that are prescribed, and there's a very high standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Impeachment doesn't have that, right? Impeachment is removal from office for high crimes and misdemeanors. Very vague, very subjective, and as Sai said, very political. It requires two-thirds of the Senate to define what that is. Um, so there isn't a lot of fair notice. That's why it is being used, I think Sai is absolutely right, in a very politicized way now. That's really strikingly different from crimes that are charged, that are defined by law. There's precedent which interprets what those things mean. That gives everybody clear notice as to what they can and can't do. Impeachment doesn't really have that at all. Um, so going all the way back to the initial topic of accountability, um, if there is a conviction of crimes, again, with all the attendant protections of due process and of the presumption of innocence and of, uh, of vigorous challenge to that evidence, I think that has the potential to move the needle of public opinion in a way that impeachment or a congressional process or reporting of the same facts have had. Right? The facts aren't going to change. We're not going to hear anything new in these criminal cases. But in the crucible of that fair process of criminal, the criminal justice system, it has the potential, I think, to sort of have accountability in terms of the, the consequence of moving the needle of public opinion in a way that the other processes have not. And I'll just add to that, again, sort of the, the politics of this, that you might recall some of the arguments made by the now former President Trump's uh, lawyers at the second impeachment, as I recall. But I specifically remember uh, the current minority leader of the Senate from my home state of Kentucky, Mitch McConnell, who gave that very impassioned for Mitch. It's hard to think of impassioned and Mitch in the same sentence. But it, it really was for him, and I thought, an emotional speech that he gave on yeah. the floor of the Senate uh, after the acquittal of the, of the president in the second impeachment. And you might remember that if they keep reporting on this and repeating it uh, in video that uh, Senator McConnell, uh, who is a uh, law person, he has a degree from the University of Kentucky Law School, um, said that, yes, it wasn't the case that there, was, there were enough votes to uh, convict uh, the president uh, in this impeachment trial, but that he could be subject to the civil and criminal laws of this country. And now that seems to have been flipped uh, on its head um, by those who are supporting the, right. the former president, that it seems like now only if he had been, or any president had been not only impeached, but convicted and removed, could that person it's now arguments, right? yeah, uh, not be immune from prosecution. I have a lot of questions, but I, I also want to give the audience an opportunity um, to ask their own. So I think you have cards, and uh, if you do have questions and you want to write them down and pass them forward, um, I'll try to, to get a few of them um, into our time. And also, if you're online and you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll include those as well. Um, before we turn to, um, to audience questions, I, I want to give Tim an opportunity to address the role of Congress uh, in holding the president accountable, especially in using its investigatory powers and whether it has sufficient means uh, in light of the January 6th investigation. What have we learned about the power of Congress to hold the president accountable? It's very, very difficult, candidly, uh, to conduct <clears throat> a factual investigation in Congress because of the inability to adjudicate privilege assertions and the lack of enforcement mechanisms when people just defy subpoenas. So, so I came from the world of criminal justice, again, where uh, if there's a grand jury investigation and a witness says, I refuse to answer that question because it's protected by an executive privilege, um, then if the prosecutor disagrees with that, they go right upstairs to the chief judge who's presiding over the grand jury who rules right away whether or not that privilege is or isn't valid. It gets immediately appealed in a motion to stay the judge's ruling, and that is also immediately adjudicated. So what you've seen is the special counsel uh, has gotten information from Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, from former Vice President Pence, who have been forced to answer questions when they're 
assertions of executive privilege were overcome by rulings. Essentially, the judge said that is outside of the official function of the presidency and this and the, the importance of the information to the criminal process outweighs the policy interest in preserving the confidentiality, confidentiality that we didn't have the ability to do that. So when, when the select committee got a privilege assertion, even if it was completely meritless, someone who doesn't even work in the executive branch said, I'm not going to answer that question because it's covered by an attorney-client privilege or an executive privilege. We had to go to court. We had to go to a civil proceeding, and there would be long periods of briefing by each side, and we were going to expire at the end of the Congress, and lawyers knew that and could essentially run out the clock. And if people defied subpoenas, like Steve Bannon did or Mark Meadows did, um, our options were either to refer them to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution, which doesn't get the information. It's, it's simply a means of holding them accountable for not responding to the subpoena, litigate civilly with a civil contempt process, which takes forever, or something called inherent contempt, where Congress has the power to send the sergeant at arms to someone's, uh, to, to put them into a holding facility in the Capitol building until they comply. Uh, even though Jamie Raskin was in love with inherent contempt and pushed <laughs> us to do it, the other members were very nervous about setting that precedent. <laughs> Uh, and that sort of has become a dead letter. It hasn't been used, I think, since the 1800s. So it is essentially very, very difficult for a congressional investigative process to compel cooperation. And good lawyers in Washington are very skilled at essentially stringing this out, invoking those privileges and those assertions without Congress' really ability with any kind of um, vigorous uh, uh, enforcement mechanisms. So, I mean, as we're having this session, something unprecedented is happening in this country where right? President Trump is in New York facing criminal prosecution there. I want to ask you a, a broader question about uh, criminal prosecutions of a former president. I think there's a looming objection which goes something like this. Uh, there might be malicious prosecutions or show trials, and how, how do we um, distinguish between uh, what, what some have called legitimate prosecutions of a former president and prosecutions that are brought for political purposes to bring down a political opponent. What kind of, how do we, dis how do we make that distinction? What kind of political mechanisms? Maybe, Sai, I can start with you because I know that you've, you've written on this topic. You have scholarship that's focused on it. Uh, I know that you've been thinking about the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate prosecutions. So I'll address the question your way first. Well, thanks, Micah. The, you know, the DOJ understands that there could be this problem of perception and reality about prosecution of politicians. And so they have some rules about, uh, about these prosecutions and some, sometimes some requirements of consultation, but then also some discussion about you know, prosecutions or investigations that are begun in an election year. None of those really apply to, or most of them don't apply to President Trump. Um, my co-author and I, Ian Ayers, decided to survey former U.S. attorneys about the Trump prosecution. And so we, I think we asked, we had three or four rounds of questions about the prosecutions brought against President Trump. And interestingly enough, you get different results across the different prosecutions. The prosecution with the most support, a bipartisan support, is the Florida prosecution. The prosecution with the least support is the New York prosecution. And we were calling upon U.S. attorneys to, you know, to you know, use their judgment, their expertise, et cetera, to, to weigh in. And so that fact alone is interesting. Over two thirds, I think, of the prosecutors supported the uh, prosecution in Florida. I think the prosecutions in New York were supported by less than, I think, half of, of the U.S. attorneys that responded. Of course, we didn't get all of them to respond. I don't know if Tim responded. Maybe he was <laughs> smart enough to ignore us. I was on the pro but, side, so. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, the thought process was, well, maybe we should have some check on the prosecution of, of politicians by establishing some, some sort of mechanism by which we would, you know, distinguish proper prosecutions from maybe prosecutions that reflected some sort of partisanship. And it's not just about the Trump prosecutions. Of course, you have to worry about the prosecutions going forward. And so Ian Ayers, my co-author, said we should just have a two-thirds requirement. If you get two-thirds of a politically bipartisan panel of U.S. attorneys to agree to a prosecution of a former president or a presidential candidate, the prosecution go, can go forward. And if you can't, you can't. And so what that would mean is you know, if 20 people are in 
in the room and, and 10 are Republican appointed prosecutors and 10 are Democratic appointed prosecutors. Even if every single Democratic prosecutor wanted to bring the prosecution or wanted to approve it, you'd still need three. And But as we found out, there were, there were Democratic prosecutors who didn't believe in the strength of some of these prosecutions and Republican prosecutors who did. So in some measure, actually, it was it was a, a little sort of uplifting, was an uplifting project because people just didn't vote on a partisan basis. I, I mean, I think there was a difference between Democratic and Republican prosecutors of the sort that you'd expect. But, you know, a good number of Republican prosecutors favored the prosecution of Florida and a good number of Democratic prosecutors did not favor the prosecution in New York. Yeah, so one of the problems with this question is that there are a lot of things that inform the decision to bring a criminal case. It's not simply, did a crime occur? That's the central question. Is there sufficient evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this crime occurred? But, but you can't possibly charge every single violation of the law. Prosecutors are constantly making judgments in terms of the, the appropriate use of resources, the victims or community interests whether or not a prosecution deters others from making similar criminal choices. Resource constraints, how much time will a case take? Does that pull people away from other things? So it isn't simply a matter of, is it a crime, do you charge it? That would be relatively simple if it were just a binary choice. But it just is, is not, and that's true at the local level, that's true at the federal level. So when you talk about politicians, some people feel strongly that the magnitude there, the community interest in holding politicians accountable is a really compelling community interest, are arguably the most compelling, right? Those are the people that should be held to the highest standard. And if they misstep, allegedly, then they should, that elevates the importance of the resource commitment and bringing that case criminally. Others believe, well, it would potentially deter president, I hear this argument, well, it's gonna deter presidents in the future if we hold president, former President Trump accountable. I, don't, I just don't buy that. I don't think a lot of presidents are gonna be wringing their hands all the time because they could be criminally prosecuted if they make a decision to, to conduct a drone strike or to, uh, to enforce immigration against the particular, I, I just think we're in the realm of such unprecedented conduct that I don't really see that a criminal prosecution of it will deter. So my point is more broadly, there are a lot of sort of, of, of flavors in the stew that inform whether or not a case is brought. Uh, so it's, just, it's hard to say if there's a crime, you bring it. it it's, just, it's just not that simple. I happen to be one of those people that thinks if it's an elected official, uh, he or she should be held to a high standard. And if there is evidence of a violation, that is a pretty compelling interest to proceed with the case. Barbara, I wanted to ask you, there, there is a thought that even if uh, there were a criminal conviction, that it's too damaging to our civic culture or our political culture to pursue a president in this way. And we have this precedent of Nixon being pardoned. Um, does, do you think that continues to resonate today? Is that still uh, so, something that uh, pro prosecutors ought to worry about? I do think about the Nixon pardon a lot and how people's views of it have changed over time. And we're going through various cycles about how people have thought about it. And it, the, the whole Watergate experience is what brought me into this business of studying from a political science perspective, presidents and, and the Supreme Court. So the first thing that we know happened was it probably cost Gerald Ford the election, an election in his own right in 1976 in a very close race with Jimmy Carter. Uh, by the early 2000s, the John F. Kennedy Library, Presidential Library in Boston awarded to Gerald Ford uh, its Profile and Courage Award for pardoning Richard Nixon. And remember, the reasoning for Gerald Ford doing so was to put Watergate behind us to get moving forward and to prevent having a former president uh, hauled into criminal court. Uh, now I'm hearing people go back to their original, many of them, their original views uh, of the pardon, which was no person is above the law. And I think I'm now reassured uh, by, by both Tim's concept that presidents wouldn't be dissuaded from acting and that 
uh, size view. I like his idea of having a two-thirds majority of a bipartisan group of U.S. attorneys uh, make decisions uh, with and for the Justice Department uh, that might take out some of the, the politics uh, of it. So um, I just, that is my bottom line, I think, in part, having come through uh, the Watergate era. And that is that, again, no one should be above the law in this country, least of all the president of the United States, the head of the executive branch, who takes that oath that we all took to begin today uh, to faithfully execute uh, the laws and defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. I think, just civically speaking, for our civic culture, that would do more damage than the American people seeing the law applied in uh, the kinds of ways that, that Tim referred to, that our, our judicial process and my fellowship at the Supreme Court in the early 90s in working with Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, he used to give a speech, um, and I talked to many people from around the world. I talked to 3,000 people from 70 different countries who came to this country, many of them new democracies just after the Cold War ended from Eastern Europe, from Latin America, from South America, literally some people from outer Mongolia. And they would say, how do you, how do you get this court system? You know, our court, we have a court system, but our judges are corrupt. Well, guess what? You mentioned impeachment that has worked in the judicial realm, never to remove a Supreme Court justice, but we have removed some, I think it's up to close to 20 district court judges, and it's usually for financial impropriety. But Chief Justice Rehnquist, in speaking to these groups, would say, uh, our judicial system and the Supreme Court is the jewel in our crown. And we have to keep that kind of uh, respect for and faith in our judicial system. And I think as long as that continues to be viewed as independent, I think people would give it the benefit of the doubt should a president at the federal level be brought into court. I'll leave the immunity question to uh, someone else, but I want to recommend two things for you to read. One is the amicus brief, the friend of the court brief handed in by uh, a group of historians uh, in the immunity case, and one of them is Jack Rekhoff um, from California, from Stanford. Another is Joanne Freeman from Yale. So those might be two names that you see. She's been here at the Miller Center frequently. Uh, and it just lays out the history of uh, their view, which is that a president is, is not immune. Uh, and the other is on accountability, and it's one of the essays that um, Bill commissioned and helped to lead uh, by a bipartisan set of authors, uh, Bob Bauer and Jack Goldsmith. Uh, and they wrote this for our meeting that we had in late October. It's now on the website, as all the essays are of the Miller Center, from that program. And it's called On Transparency and Presidential Accountability. And they start by defining accountability, and they distinguish between legal accountability and political accountability, and then they set out for you the kinds of legal and political accountability that would ap apply to presidents of the United States. So I have several questions from the audience, and a couple of them are heading in the same direction, so I thought I might try to consolidate them because we only have several minutes left. One of them asks, if Trump is ultimately convicted of the January 6th related charges, what penalties might be considered appropriate? And then I just want to add another question onto this one. And it says, if Trump's reelected and convicted, uh, if that's a possible scenario, could he be removed uh, from office? What does the Constitution say about this? So we've got different kinds of scenarios here depending on how these cases progress, but I think the question is, um, you know, can you have a sitting president who's under criminal prosecution? What happens if he's uh, convicted in one or another of these uh, current pending cases? Yeah, well, Something. let me. I, I can start with the Go sentencing ahead. question. So, in, in in federal court, what happens is if there's a, a conviction of any federal crime, then there are sentencing guidelines which, essentially, are, are applied and give the judge who will sentence the defendant a recommended range, and that incorporates criminal history, circumstances of the offense. It's essentially a math problem where you start with the base offense level, and there are additions or subtractions based on acceptance of responsibility to subtract or aggravating factors to enhance. I think for the crimes alleged in the January 6th case in Washington, the guideline range would include a, a recommended period of incarceration. Um, and it's really hard to come up with precedent here that sort of a similar case in which 
there'd be a, a marker. Lawyers are fond of markers or precedents or things to, to attach as a baseline for making, uh, for exercising discretion. Hard to imagine what that is here. I think if the evidence comes in and he is convicted of the four charged counts or any of the charged counts in Washington, there's a pretty decent chance of some period of incarceration. That does not preclude him from serving as President of the United States. The Constitution is clear that it's not a qualification. You have to be 35 years old, you have to be born in the United States, but you can be a felon, you can be a convicted felon and serve. Whether or not there would be steps taken by Congress or an impeachment process, I don't believe impeachment is barred by double jeopardy like the criminal process. I don't know. Again, we are really in wide open new territory here. I, I'm not really sure what the options would be, and I'm certainly not qualified to talk about the political ramifications of a conviction and an electoral victory. Cy, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, so the OLC opinion talks about prosecuting a sitting president. It doesn't talk about prosecuting or continuing to prosecute a sitting president or what to do if the, the person who becomes president is in jail. But the logic of the OLC opinion is that you can't continue a prosecution of a sitting of a new president and you can't keep the president in jail, that the impeachment process is the only means of removing a president and that you know leaving him in jail, leaving her in jail would be a, a tantamount to uh, an impeachment. I, so I suspect that if, if President Trump is being prosecuted or is in jail, uh, you know, and, and then becomes president on January 20th, his Justice Department will claim that he can't be left in jail while he's president. And that, you know, whatever position the DOJ takes will affect all federal prosecutions, including the prosecution brought by the special counsel. DOJ policy does not bind uh, state prosecutors, so they would continue to bring their prosecution. But I assume that the DOJ would intervene and then there would be a federal, you know, they would try to get the case dismissed and they would try to appeal it to the Supreme Court on an expedited basis. But the state prosecutors don't have to pay attention to what DOJ says about the federal constitution. They can come to a different conclusion and I suspect they will. Yeah, and the Supreme Court recently in the case, the 14th Amendment case, essentially said that the state of Colorado cannot invoke section three of the 14th Amendment unilaterally, Congress has to. So there is a scenario by which if, let's say the former president is convicted uh, before he is seated, Congress could conduct some sort of proceeding to essentially preclude him from service invoking Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The, the court's recent opinion essentially contemplates congressional action, rules that states cannot unilaterally invoke that provision. So another audience member asked the question, could Trump pardon himself? Uh, in advance of some of that size already giving you a reaction. I mean, it's a, it's a question that we, we looked uh, at, I think, in a previous session. So you might also want to look online for another Miller Center event about, about that. But maybe you just want to give us a, a quick uh, thought or two about uh, the possibility of self-pardoning. It's never happened. Uh, presidents never pardoned themselves. But there is a territorial governor who pardoned himself, uh, Isaac Stevens, I think the territory of Washington state issued a pardon saying, I, Isaac Stevens, pardon Isaac Stevens. And <laughs> I, I don't know if, you know, what effect it had. I don't think the person went to jail. So Trump could do that. Of course, he could have tried to do that before he left office. I don't know why he didn't do it, but he could do it now. But I mean, it, the, the, if the DOJ is going to stop the prosecution, there's no need to pardon yourself. The pardon wouldn't be effective against any state crime anyway, so it would have no effect on those prosecutions. So I, I doubt that he's going to pardon himself. If he wanted to do it, he would do it when he left again, so that the, the prosecutions that have been held in abeyance didn't continue. But you know, we're we're talking uh, a lot of uh, nonsense on stills. Well, I, so I, in addition to visiting Montpelier, Mr. Madison's home, I also visited his gravesite, and I think his anticipation of what Cy was saying, I, I think I started to hear him spin in that <laughs> cemetery at Montpelier because again. How could the founders have anticipated such a thing that uh, a convicted person would become president and that um, he could pardon himself or she someday? It's just beyond my comprehension. To, to Sai's point, there was active discussion of this bef right before President Trump reluctantly left office. Can, should he issue a pardon to himself, to members of his family? There are a lot of people who were arguably implicated in the events leading up to January 6th who were 
asking the president for pardons. And according to the White House counsel and others, there was, there was a lot of discussion inside the White House on this very question. I think we are at time, right? So I, at the law school, am I right about that? I think. We're just about our, can I just say yeah. one last thing about pardons? And yep. that is, uh, Richard Nixon had a Duke Law degree, Gerald Ford had a Yale Law degree. Why would they have felt there was a need to issue and accept a pardon if they thought that a former president was immune? I'll leave you with that. <laughs> At the law school, we like to say that there are more questions, but no more time. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking our, our panel.